Good evening. Um, I'm Dr. James Cora. Actually, I'm not Dr. James Cora. That's incredibly pretentious. Uh, I'm James Cora. I'm uh, the secretary to the Church Investors Group, which is the membership organization for many of the largest institutional church investors in the UK and Ireland. And I'm also deputy head of Ethical and Responsible Investment at CCLA. And I'm really, really pleased to welcome you to this Just Share lecture uh, this evening. For, for those of you who don't know, Just Share is a coalition of churches and charities committed to um, global development and social justice through three public debates and lectures such as the one this evening, rooted within the city of London, but also beyond. And um, leaflets of the upcoming program can be found at the back. And I must say, please do stay on afterwards for further discussion and networking over some fair trade wine. Um, I very much look forward to talking to many of you then. This evening, it's absolutely fantastic to have Dr. Eve Paul from um, Atteridge Business School with us to talk about the seven deadly sins of, of capitalism. And this subject is incredibly pertinent for the work that we as church investors do on a daily basis. I wasn't really going to say much this evening, but the, the remaining nativity scene has, has kind of brought a story back to my mind and a key role um, that I do on a day-to-day -day basis to represent the church in discussions with the management of some of the largest businesses in the UK. And our church, um, many of our churches told us that they wanted us to work with companies in the hotel sector on their approach to mitigating the risk of child sex trafficking happening in, uh, in the hotel rooms that uh, they own a part of. And during this engagement, one of the most, um, well, one of the stories I've dined out on for the most for the past uh, year or so came up. And it really epitomized the fact that the church sometimes struggles to talk about, talk to business and talk about these issues. And we were meeting with one of the senior executives of a large UK-based hotel group, and we had a, a pretty difficult conversation. And they really weren't understanding our perspective at all. And this was borne out at the end of, at the, end of the meeting when the representative, a very senior, senior person in this company, said to us, your churches, you really should like the hotel sector. And we were looking rather bemused. Uh, we weren't really thinking through what, where this was going, and he could tell that we weren't actually uh, following his points. And he, he turned around to us and said, and this is why I, I let go which company it was, we at uh, Intercontinental Hotels Group well, we just want to let you know that we wouldn't have turned Mary and Joseph away. Uh, and that was the low point in an engagement that went on to be absolutely, incredibly productive and we managed to work together to generate policies that really did take steps to make sure that their staff knew to what to look for in, in the rare, fortunately rare, uh, but very disturbing instances where things can happen and it's how churches can make a difference. But back to Eve's talk this evening and it, it really is great to have her here, just so you know who she is. So Dr. Eve Paul is from the Atteridge Business School, and again, I, I'm slightly on edge because I did some presentation training there, so I feel that I'm uh, going to be judged. But um, Eve's taught MBAs and executives from public, private, and voluntary sectors. She's taught uh, ambassadors in the Foreign Office, operations directors at Tesco, and the cast of the Royal Shakespeare Company. Her research interests include capitalism and theology, leader smithing, and ethics, and accelerated learning. Eve's first degree was in theology from the University of Durham. She started her career at the Church Commissioners, who um, I know very well, there, before gaining an MBA from the University of Edinburgh. She then worked for Deloitte Consulting, where she specialized in change management, particularly in the financial services industry. Eve studied part-time for her PhD, graduated from Cambridge University in 2010. Eve is also the chair of the Ridley Hall Faith and Business Initiative in Cambridge. She is also a co-founder of the Foundation for Workplace, Sustainability, uh, Workplace Spirituality I'm sorry, and has served as a trustee for the Foundation of Church Leadership and the Christian Association of Business Executives. Eve had twin girls in 2012 who, um, as you can imagine, keep her rather busy. Uh, so, she's not, uh, so she's now got a long list of ex-hobbies, including singing, skiing, fencing, and millinery. She has published widely, and her books are on the church and capitalism and ethical leadership and her forthcoming book is what I'm really excited about learning more about tonight. So, on behalf of all of you, can I welcome Eve to give this evening's lecture. Thank you very much for coming out on this very gloomy night with all of this rain. Um, it's quite a boomy acoustic, so I thought it might be helpful if I posted the text of this on my blog. So for any of you who have tablets or smartphones or anything with you,
um, by the wizards of technology. It should be kind of appearing any time now on my blog for you to follow along if at any point you can't understand what I'm saying or if subsequently you want to look back and see what it was I was trying to say uh, if you find it hard to follow what I'm saying now. There should be a generous amount of time at the end for questions, so please do be thinking as you go through anything I'm not explaining well, anything that you want to hear more on. Um, and of course, in this uh, day and age of technology, do please feel free to follow up on anything um, subsequently through email or Twitter or anything like that. The last time I was here, I was debating um, from one of these pulpits about um, how ethical the church's investments are. And I used as a framework that night um, the seven virtues. So it seems particularly appropriate tonight that I'm talking about capitalism, the seven deadly sins. So in general, market capitalism depends on seven big ideas. And economists like to look scientific, so they tend to present these ideas as laws of nature. But even scientific truth is no longer this fixed. And the flat earthers have moved on, but not the economists. The seven big ideas that served the market so well in the past have now become sins, not virtues, and are now toxic to its future. Unless we correct the system at a fundamental level, reform is doomed to fail. But where on earth do you start? Tonight, I'll start with a quick rundown on what these seven deadly sins are, and then I'll talk a bit about the theology that informs my critique. After all, if I'm going to talk about the market's assumptions, I should be clear about the beliefs that I hold uh, in that regard as well. And then I'll also suggest some ways I think Christians are particularly well-placed to get involved in turning the market around to make it a bit more kingdom-shaped. When I was little, there was an annual fair in St Andrews up in Scotland, the Lammas Market, and they always had um, a side show you might remember called Whack-A-Mole. And it was one of these rather gruesome <laughs> exhibits where you had a hammer and all these moles would pop up through holes and you would sort of bash them and you had to bash as many moles as you could to win the prize. And I gather that if you go to the arcade on Southwall Pier, they have a version of this which is bankers, not moles, and you sort of bash as many bankers as you can. And of course, we know from the media that's terrific fun, and we've been doing it ever since the credit crunch, but it kind of misses the point, really, which is not really trying to get to the heart of what's really gone wrong and what can we do about it now. And as I've said in science, no one believes that the Earth is flat anymore, but economists haven't actually budged from their worldview at all. And to make the system feel safe, the rules of the market are still described as these laws of nature which don't change. But in science, temporary hypotheses have always been seen as the necessary road to progress. A hypothesis generates a theory that's held until evidence emerges to disprove it. So the modern scientist would scoff at alchemy and phrenology and the idea that the humours could be rebalanced by bloodletting. But it was these very assumptions that paved the way for later insight. Newtonian physics was challenged by Einstein, who nowadays has been challenged by data emerging from the Large Hadron Collider. And science ultimately welcomes each upheaval as a sign that mankind is moving closer towards the truth. And in ignoring this process, economics has become a victim of its attempt to look credible. It's so stuck in the past, it's now struggling to keep up with the facts as we see them today. My sister was once stung by a bee, and luckily we were staying at my grandparents' house in Oxford, and they were both medics. So they rushed around like mad, and Grandpa got his stethoscope out, and Granny got her first aid kit, and they spent a great amount of time bandaging up her leg. And at the end of it, she was still crying, and they couldn't believe why she was being so ungrateful after all this kerfuffle. And eventually, they managed to get her to tell them what was going on. And she said, but it was the other leg. <laughs> and I think this is the problem with a lot of what we're trying to do with the market, is we're actually fixing the wrong problems, which is why we need to go a little bit deeper. So your five-year-old has just been given a nice £20 note from his granny, and young Johnny says, who's this guy with the big nose? And you say, ah, oh, that's Adam Smith, the father of capitalism. And you only realize your mistake when young Johnny goes, what's capitalism? And you go, um. <laughs> and you may have bought things on eBay. eBay is a great way to describe capitalism because it's quite a pure version of the system. 
I want to pay for a holiday, so I decide to flog off an old heirloom. Strangers compete with each other to buy it, and they check out the going price by seeing what similar items have gone for recently. We don't know each other, but because eBay has these feedback mechanisms, nobody wants to deal with anyone dodgy, so we all try and keep our feedback clean. And the system means that I get my holiday cash, and the winner of the auction gets their heirloom. We're each acting selfishly in our own interests, but somehow everyone doing just that seems to work out fine in the long term. If items don't appear on eBay very often, they attract a bidding war and high prices. If they're everyday items, they tend to follow a predictable pattern, with prices staying fairly stable over time. Looking at this more formally, there are seven big ideas sitting behind this system, as described by the guy on the £20 note all those years ago. First, the whole system assumes competition, on the grounds that it makes people try harder. And this improves the quality of the market over time, as organizations vie with each other for market share, and people compete for jobs. Apple stays in the game by designing better products than its rivals. Supermarkets advertise price drops, and ambitious executives get an MBA or do a presentation skills course at Ashridge to give them an edge in the job market. This is competition at work, improving the marketplace. This welter of competitive activity is coordinated at the top by the so-called invisible hand. This works imperceptibly, bringing together billions of customers and producers worldwide, matching supply to demand, such that everything works out right overall. And what should be a chaotic mess somehow resolves into happy customers and rising profits to the benefit of society as a whole. And Adam Smith's biggest idea of all is that all we need to do to keep this process working is to be selfish. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. So if we maximize our own utility in any transaction we make, that leaves the invisible hand free to do its job. While we look out for ourselves, it resolves everything for us in the system as a whole. And the way the invisible hand does this is through pricing. The price of something acts as a signal to help match up people who want to buy something with people who want to sell things. Low prices attract more customers, while high prices restrict demand to a smaller circle. So everyday items like toothpaste are cheap and readily available, while products that are rare, like vintage champagne or old masters, carry a high price. Changes in price affect buying behavior by making items more or less attractive. And provided governments let them be, markets use the ebb and flow of pricing to regulate supply and demand. Within the system, people form organizations to generate wealth by producing goods and services. Most of them form companies to do this, owned by shareholders who provide the money to set them up in the first place. These owners employ people as their agents to work for them. But because the market works best when we all pursue our own ends, there is a danger that the interests of the owners and their employees will diverge as each seeks to maximize their own utility. This conflict of interest is called agency theory and basically means that a lot of HR policy is about incentivizing employees to work in the interests of the owners. And because the interests of the shareholders are so important, Corporate strategy these days is all about how best to maximize shareholder value. And this means keeping the share price high. Organizations use this barometer to set targets for staff, and many grant their senior staff shares to make sure that the company's share price is always extremely close to their heart. And most of these companies are set up using the legal concept of limited liability. This means that all the owners stand to lose if the company folds, is the money they originally invested in it. And this shields the owners from any downside, which encourages people to invest. This flow of new capital is the lifeblood of the market and is vital to keep the wheels of the market perpetually turning. So far, so good. But actually, if you zoom in on any one of these seven key ideas, these firm foundations start to blur and wobble a bit. First, competition, which is the linchpin of the entire system. Rather than out-and-out -out competition, these days the mathematicians would argue 
in favour of cooperation as a primary strategy because it yields better outcomes. If you're in a war, winning at all costs is necessary for survival. But in business, companies want longer-term customer and supplier relationships. And those who treat transactions as battles to be won or lost sooner or later come a cropper as their brand tarnishes and the market votes them out. On the other hand, cooperation and the sharing of information increases the size of the pie instead of restricting the debate to arguments about how best to cut it up. And competition isn't just mathematically questionable, it's sexist too. While male fight-or-flight physiology favours competition, particularly in challenging environments, it ignores the role that female physiology has to play. And research conducted on female subjects suggests quite a different physiological response to stress, one that instead of fight-or-flight has been dubbed tend and befriend. So being hooked on competition may actually be compounding a tendency in the market towards suboptimal outcomes, reinforced with the norms of a traditionally masculine business environment. The second of our assumptions, the invisible hand. It turns out this is just a very optimistic myth. It's very reassuring, but very inaccurate. And as a justification for self-interested behavior, doesn't really stack up. Because while order does frequently arise out of chaos, there's no evidence to suggest this always tends towards the good. And certainly none sufficient to justify society's reliance on it. The crowd is sometimes wise, but not invariably so. In fact, leaving things to the invisible hand skews the market in favor of the strongest and most powerful. And this maximizes their utility, but not that of society or the world at large. And this idea of utility, our third big assumption, as the best way to measure the effectiveness and morality of the market, only really works if the invisible hand does exist. This is because the concept is an empty one, utility for what? If there's no guarantee that being individually selfish produces a good outcome overall, a system based on this thinking can't be moral without help. And the sort of help this requires, government intervention, is exactly what the economists are trying to avoid because it interferes with the smooth workings of the market and gets very political very fast. And even if this idea was a sound one, the idea that economic man is a rational agent, we all know is wildly optimistic. We're all subject to irrational urges, whether through peer pressure, emotions, or our psychological makeup. And assuming we're all robots just leads to confusion about how the market really works and about how best, therefore, to run it. Our fourth assumption, the price mechanism, and the idea that we should leave it to its own devices and it'll settle at a scientific equilibrium. But this is nonsense because it ignores the interplay between supply and demand and the potential for both of these to be manipulated. As well as airbrushing out the historical debate about just prices, market pricing ignores historical questions about cost. And this obscures a very important debate about hidden costs or externalities like the social cost of drinking or smoking or the cost of pollution. In an age where the limits of the planet are starting to be felt, it's vital that this debate about the market's embeddedness is not ignored. There is now no cod left in Newfoundland, and the planet is running out of other commodities all the time. And fifth, Adam Smith's original notion about the different interests of owners and managers has had catastrophic consequences. It's used negative psychology to generate HR policies that assume employee recalcitrance limiting the ability of organizations to unlock human potential. Worse, it's been used to justify the disastrous ubiquity of executive shareholding. This practice, hand in hand with the idea of the supremacy of the shareholder, has made corporate strategy defiantly short-term and manipulative. Six, the belief in the shareholder as king owes more to a romanticized ideal about the nature of shareholding than it does to reality. Ignoring the extremely limited sense in which shareholders actually own businesses, modern patterns of shareholding make shareholder a rather bizarre concept. Do you know the average time for which a share is now held? It's about 11 seconds. Blink and you'll miss it. So sticking to the romance that the shareholder is a nice old bloke who founded the company just drives short-termism, because an attempt to keep him in socks by keeping the share price high 
means companies neglect the wider issues of governance and accountability by ignoring other stakeholders. And this romanticism has fueled the exponential rise of boardroom pay and an overly narrow measurement of corporate performance. And many would now argue that shareholder value is the WMD of capitalism. So our last assumption, the dominance of the limited liability model, which is very risky. In a global economy, the resilience of the system will always depend on its diversity. So no one single model should have a monopoly. In institutionalizing moral hazard, limit liability also plays into an increasingly irresponsible shareholder culture because there is no downside. More encouragement in law and public policy of alternative models for enterprise would introduce healthy competition between business models and more employee ownership and mutualization would spread risk as well as creating a wider range of businesses with different risk profiles, different ways of engaging people and different models of success. So these core assumptions, what I'm calling capitalism's seven deadly sins, have really got to be destroyed before a healthier system can be created like a phoenix from their ashes. And I'd hope that anyone listening to these arguments would be persuaded by them without any further ado, because little of what I've said is actually revolutionary or new. But we're here tonight in this place because Christians have a particular contribution to make to this important debate. Too often, theology in the public square is a bit like the Britisher abroad. If you just say it very loudly and very slowly, they'll eventually get what you're on about. And theologians quite often decline to comment on anything technical, um, like economics or finance, which just concedes the fight without any punches being thrown. But Jesus was not afraid of wading into controversy, and we must be similarly bold. And if theology is ever to escape the charge of being irrelevant or just preaching to the converted, brave theologians must ask difficult questions in the public square. If only on the basis that every one of us has a worldview religious or otherwise, declared or otherwise. And in this case, the worldview that cradled capitalism was unashamedly Christian. So reforming capitalism from the same worldview has a historical and cultural logic to it. But as we've seen, capitalism's seven deadly sins are competition, the invisible hand, the assumption of utility, the assumption that market pricing is just, the assumption of agency theory, the assumption of the supremacy of the shareholder, and the assumption of the legitimacy of the limited liability model. In each case, these assumptions have become flawed. From a Christian point of view, though, these flaws aren't just operational errors, they're grave injustices. First, man is made in the image of God and is given stewardship over creation for the good of the whole of creation. Economics, or the running of the household, is therefore seen by Christians as a sacred trust, not a dismal science. While on the face of it, competition appears an optimal strategy because it aims to improve outcomes over time, the costs of it are too great. Squandering information by hoarding it is wasteful and reduces the possibility of better outcomes. And while game playing does enable the exercise of God-given intelligence, making it the default approach to economic life privileges ego over outcome to the disbenefit of creation as a whole. A bias towards the male of the species is also repugnant to most Christians in spite of much official HR policy to the contrary. So what would a regulatory and business context based on cooperate where you can, compete where you must look like? Second, the invisible hand looks Christian because it borrows from the idea of divine providence. And while many Christians still believe in some sort of benign fate, the gift of free will does carry with it the responsibility of its exercise. And this argues against a laissez-faire attitude, particularly one that's been shown to advantage the rich and the powerful at the expense of the poor and vulnerable and of the planet's resources more generally. So how could the poor's full participation in the marketplace be accelerated? And how could the riches be tempered to restore justice? Third, utility encourages an impoverished interpretation of the nature and destiny of mankind. Our Trinitarian God has created us out of an interrelationship. A short-term transactional and competitive frame makes us adversaries, not brothers. 
God has also designed us richly and not as automata, and the complexity of our decision-making is still only partially understood. That we have a capacity and a calling to be selfless is a cornerstone of Christian belief. So the selfishness of economic man is a travesty. And I wonder what a corporate strategy would look like if it was genuinely based on maximizing human flourishing and what that would mean for the culture and results of organizations. Fourth, market pricing. Again, laissez-faire is actually a vote for the powerful. Allowing pricing to be manipulated pollutes the entire marketplace by sending distorting signals. And Christians as stewards cannot ignore the issue of costs, just pricing and externalities. And this assumption is possibly the trickiest to unpick because history suggests that states distort prices as badly as do unfettered markets. But transparency and disclosure about costs, margins and impacts, even in the subsidiaries of subsidiaries, would allow consumers to make better choices about which products and services to buy. So why can't corporates publish breakdowns of their costs margins and impacts more transparently. Fifth, agency theory, which would appear to be justified because of original sin. But Christ's sacrifice paid this debt, and there is no room for such a stunted reading of human nature in Christian theology. God gave us the ultimate freedom, and it does violence to the very essence of the Christian story to assume the recalcitrance of man. Of course we incline to sin, but structuring it in just encourages it creating a race to the bottom that's fundamentally dehumanizing, as in the case of executive pay. So how might a glass half-full approach, coupled with visibility, encourage better behavior? Six, the narrow view that shareholder rights trump all others is an affront to the notion of stewardship. It trivializes the human endeavor bound up in an organization and encourages an arm's length approach to responsibility. The only Christian way to view the aim of an organization is to look at its contribution to human and planetary flourishing. The culture of greed inculcated by the twin evils of agency theory and shareholder value is deeply sinful. So why are we hanging on to this model? And what would need to happen for it to be dismissed as a flat earth philosophy? Seventh, limited liability as a model structures in moral hazard and schools, executives, and irresponsibility. A Christian reading of the situation would argue in favor of a much more democratic approach to ownership, one that recognizes more fully the contribution and role of employees who are made in the image of God and are exercising their God-given talents in the workplace. And given that the results of shared ownership speak for themselves, what is really stopping more companies from migrating to this model? So these themes of human nature, freedom, responsibility, and the protection of the vulnerable, point towards an economy that is just more careful of relationship. The test of its health is the health of every single relationship, consumer, customer, supplier, employer, employee, neighbor, environment, these all merit due waiting. In the jargon, we're dealing with a complex adaptive system and such systems are so fragile and responsive that the best way to influence them is through nudges and not shoves. So for Christians, what would good nudges look like? Well, we're probably all familiar in the secular world with government nudges like fluoride and tap water and free school meals and the smoking ban. But did you know that the reason there are mirrors in lifts is to reduce graffiti? and that if you plant trees and shrubs in housing developments, it halves property and violent crime. And one of my favorite nudges is in Telford, where they've set a speed restriction of 12 miles an hour. Because you'd have to drive pretty carefully to observe that, wouldn't you? And the Cabinet Office now has its own nudge unit to come up with better choice architecture for all of us. A recent nudge that they came up with was the introduction of alcohol gel throughout hospitals to encourage hand sanitation and it reduced superbug infections by 40% in the space of a year. And of course, I do have a large list of things I'd like the government to do, but I don't think we can afford to wait for them to catch up. In any case, there's a compelling body of research that suggests that consumer action is often more effective than state intervention in bringing about rapid change. But those who have the most power are the most able to shape the system in their own image. Every transaction is like a vote. 
So rich consumers obviously have more votes than the poor. Apart from $100,000 handbags, we've created markets for such vital products as collar stiffeners and mobile phone charms, whose utility might puzzle those who are struggling to put bread on the table. In the UK, many towns have lost their fishmonger, but they've gained a fish spa, where the well-heeled can now have a manicure carried out by Gara Rufa fish, but you have to drive out of town to get your fish from a supermarket. On the upside, Charities, social enterprises, and enlightened multinationals move ceaselessly to create new markets for the poor by voting on their behalf. For example, Tough Stuff and Selco have pioneered the use of solar power and rechargeable batteries in Africa and India to fuel lights, mobile phones, radios, and sewing machines. And HP has introduced a new solar-powered digital camera and backpack printer distributed through self-help groups of local women. And cheap wireless computers are now available with antennae made from recycled tin cans. The fact that the system is just a massive complex of relationships and transactions is a huge opportunity for Christians everywhere. Christians are estimated to control $10 trillion around the world. At least 6% of the world's investment capital is reckoned to be in the hands of religious bodies. And in England, the church commissioners alone have an asset portfolio of five and a half billion pounds, while collectively, Anglican PCCs spend over 800 million pounds a year. We are the rich, so we should be doing more with our financial votes to include the poor in the global market pace. And there are a lot of us. According to the census, every other person you meet in the street considers themselves to be a Christian. And every Sunday, one million people go to a Church of England church. One in four primary schools are run by the Church of England, teaching a million children every year. And there are still 26 bishops in the House of Lords and over 25,000 Church of England clergy active in their local communities. This represents a lot of muscle that could be mobilized in shops and online, in businesses and in the investment community. And one example of such action is the fair trade movement. While there have been fair trade goods around for a while, in 1998, the market in the UK was only worth £17 million annually. But thanks to strong support from Christians buying fair trade products at the back of the church every Sunday, over the next decade, the market multiplied exponentially, reaching the £1 billion mark in 2010. And now the UK coffee market is about 15% fair trade, which shows it really doesn't take that long to transform a whole sector by creating an entirely new segment. So let's imagine that you're standing at the pearly gates and St. Peter asked to see your bank statement. Would you be proud of it? Because if you want to help reform the market, you can start right there. Where do you bank? Do you support your local credit union or invest through microfinance or peer lending schemes? Which charities and churches do you support through regular and tax efficient giving? And where do you shop? Are there transactions on your bank statement from local shops, as well as from Tesco and Amazon? Research by the New Economics Foundation has found that every one pound spent with a local supplier is worth one pound 76 to the local economy, but only 36p if it's spent in a national chain. There's a great local initiative in Cape Cod over in the States. Their community campaign asks you to identify three local enterprises that you like having around and pledge to spend $50 a month with each of them. And this is great nudge thinking, because browsing in that quirky bookshop and then buying cheaper online just means the quirky bookshop won't be there for very much longer. Use it or lose it. And for goodness sake, spend more time in your local pub, lest you lose that too. So, hooray, a pretty bank statement from a nice bank, a wash with charitable giving and ethical shopping. But please don't stop there. Do you know where your investments are held? Most of us have a pension or two somewhere. Can you contact your fund manager and ask difficult questions about investment policy in case you're also up to your eyeballs in Wonga? And the million dollar question, where do you spend that most precious of your assets, your labor? Whether you're in paid or voluntary employment, what more could you do to influence the policies and practices of your organization and church to convert yet more capital to more kingdom-friendly economic activity.
And do your prayers at home and at church include not just the poor, but also the rich who could be doing so much more to right the balance of this lopsided market? There's a 1926 recording of Bow Bells that was broadcast by the BBC World Service during the Second World War as a symbol of hope to the free people of Europe. And they still use it as an interval signal, I gather. So I think anyone could be a cockney if you had it on in their labour ward. Like the bells, just share was established to be a symbol of hope, a physical manifestation of economic justice for all, right in the heart of this global financial centre. And each of you here today has the potential to be the salt and light of a new economy, one that nurtures relationships rather than converts them into net present value. So may I send you out with an uncomfortable conscience about your own bank statement. And I think if we all just start there, great and graceful things may happen. Thank you. Global capitalism would say that the size matters because global capitalism would say that um, you know, the bigger the company, you get um, um, economies of scale. So I like the idea of the local um, economy and um, feeling empowered to live locally, um, but with a re global responsibility, perhaps. Um, but how do you see that happening within a company? So scale and um, size mattering, and, and obviously, if you're trying to get economies of scale, does it just limit your ability to get much done if you just stay local? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there are lots of, of, of good examples of what they're calling glocalization these days, which is the big companies trying to be more rooted in their communities. Some of that is by policies about who they work with, um, and some of it is about where their actual operations are. Um, for instance, there's one organization I know of who has decided that um, one of the games that gets played with small suppliers locally is not to pay them on time. You've probably all heard of that. You leave it till the sort of three months or whatever and hope that they don't have the wherewithal to take you to court. Um, and because that was really affecting the local economy, they decided they were going to have a policy of paying within one month of receipt of invoice, which of course just gets cash into the local community much quicker because a lot of the people working for them on a contract basis were local. Um, I mean, I think there's some really good examples um, across the sectors. If you think about the International um, Centre for Franchising, they're trying to help charities who tend to be quite local, uh, the vast majority of them, scale up through franchising models by saying, well, if you've solved the problem somewhere in the world, why can't we solve it everywhere in the world by using your template and rolling things out more quickly? So the food banks in this country have been able to scale up quickly because the Trussell Trust has that kind of structure and you can roll out a food bank very quickly because you'd literally take the template, go to your church and start one. So I think there, it is a massive dilemma. How do you get scale um, and still stay local? I think the mindset about cooperation helps with that because there's nothing to stop small local outfits having partnerships with larger ones all over the world. What has stopped it in the past is this idea that you don't want to share because you must compete and you must keep your cards close to your chest and compete with everyone else. And, you know, if you talk to them, then that'll be your market share out the window. And I think we're seeing in the business world in particular, um, but particularly fueled by um, development effort from NGOs, much more partnering and trying to scale up through partnerships rather than necessarily having huge, massive organizations everywhere. Thank you. Hey, open the floor to more questions. <laughs> I'd be interested to know your views on credit, given that one, it's traditionally seen as a, a lifeblood of capitalism, two, it's looked on disfavorably by, by Christianity in the form of usury, and three, I think the Archbishop of Canterbury recently said something about under, the church playing a role in undercutting firms like Wonga by offering cheaper short-term loans. Yes. I think credit is real problem. I mean, I don't think there is enough theology about this because um, I think Peter Selby, who was the Bishop of Worcester, wrote a very good book on this called Grace and Mortgage, which was trying to say that there isn't really any theology about being in debt other than being in debt to God for you know, the, the debt having been paid off through Christ. So really, we're not debtors anymore. <laughs> so it, it's funny that our economy seems to be entirely based on debt. And of course, when I did my MBA, we were taught the mantra that debt is cheaper than equity and you must, you know, 
You don't have pesky shareholders if you just get you know, leveraged up to your eyeballs. Um, I think there does need to be a massive correction because I think there's some dodgy thinking behind that. I'm not entirely clear in my own mind because I do appreciate that spread. It's, it's a bit like this modern practice of paying, um, paying at the end of the month for a whole month's work. The week, or um, paid in two week slots because people aren't all brilliant at budgeting. So I can kind of see that sometimes people need help in spreading costs over a month, and credit can be useful um, for that sort of thing. I'm not sure I really understand leverage apart from games being played around manipulating various ratios to impress investors. Um, I think you know it, it was traditionally easier to get a loan off the bank than to go back out to shareholders to get more cash. Um, but we've seen what kind of economy that's created. So it is something I think is ripe for revolution, because I think theologically it's a pretty dodgy concept. And having um, an economy based on it makes people think that you can spend before you've earned. Um, and that isn't something I, I think there's an, an awful lot of morality around. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for a really interesting lecture. Just thinking through from the perspective of people that perhaps the whole idea of money and economy and thinking that through is, is quite a significant turn off or how do people kind of engage with this uh, at a more sort of basic, I mean, you have some great examples, but how, how kind of, what is there in terms of sort of wider sort of thinking around money and engaging in that that can make it come alive in the more in the everyday for people and how that connects to business and daily life? I think if we're talking about churches in the short, short term, because it's not just the churches that need to get mobilized on this, there's something about tooling up the clergy not to feel scared to talk about it as a matter of course, and that's something that I know Rich Dickinson does a lot about in um, Faith and Business in Cambridge. Because um, there is a problem that people have believed this hype about you know, their economists and their scientists, and it's a bit like having a fight about the Higgs boson and can't even spell it and all that kind of thing. Um, and it's nonsense. I mean, fair trade is a really good example because that was just Mrs. Miggins in the back saying, mate, you, know, you should try this coffee and it's better for people. And you know, that sort of personal contact through friends who recommend things and say this is another way to be. There's a huge number of resources around helping with debt counselling and helping with just educating people about budgeting. Um, the Trust or Trust is pushing a lot of that alongside the food banks to try and help people get themselves out of problems. And it's certainly something that Justin Welby is pushing alongside um, credit unions and everything else. But I think you're right. I think it's not about anything grand, like saying, let's overflow capitalism. I mean, I can do that with you know, writing stroppy books and being difficult with people. I think locally, we've just got to identify small things we can do, like say, we want to buy this swimming pool that will otherwise be closed down and run it as a community resource, or we want to keep this park open for the children, so we're going to object to planning in that area and form a consortium or you know, local things that really matter to people. And then that scales up naturally over time. I'm going to take the opportunity to do a shameless plug for a third party organization. And um, Eve talked about your pension providers, and there's an organization called Share Action who have a website where you can just type in the name of your pension provider and they'll send an automated email asking what they are doing in regards to integrating environmental concerns. So don't feel that finance is some big thing. There is easy ways that you can ask that question. Uh, and I've spoken far too much, so, so do raise your hand if you have any further questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to pick up on the point you made about HR policies within, within business, within yeah. employers. And you talked about HR policies assuming human recalcitrance, I think was the phrase yeah. that, was, that was used. And the one example you gave was around employee share ownership, employee ownership of business. Could you give perhaps some other examples of what employers could be doing on a practical level, on a day-to-day -day basis, to make the difference that you've talked about? Well, I think um, there's a huge debate raging about um, how you structure performance management and therefore reward. Um, and I don't know how many of you are subject to these sort of six monthly and annual meetings where you sit down and you agree your objectives and then you have to perform against them, otherwise you don't get um, whatever bonus or concessions are being made to reward you for this sort of behavior. The thing about that is it's very reductionist. It's saying your job is these five objectives. 
So of course what everyone does is they only do those objectives because otherwise they'll get told off. You know, some cool thing might happen, a customer might phone up and say, how about this? Not on my objectives. Why would I do that? You know, because I'm not going to get rewarded for it. So that's a very slight example, but it's so endemic in almost every piece of HR policy you stumble across is assuming that the unions will have you if you don't do it like this and we've got to get the processes right because otherwise there'll be a problem here and we must make sure that people you know, do their job properly by getting all the contracting right and getting all the paperwork right. In my experience, people always feel they could give more and they want to give more, but they don't feel their opinions are listened to, they don't think they're particularly valued and they're a bit worried that if they go out on a limb and suggest something a bit crazy, they'll just get slapped down. Um, and I do see some organisations where they're much more interested in, well, what would your objectives be, actually? What would you really like to shape this year? Whether it's by giving some discretionary time. So there's all these famous companies like Google or 3M who give a percentage of your time, whether it's 10 15%. And I think W.R. Gore do as well for personal projects. And the idea is that invisible hand styly that will all somehow come good. I'm not sure how much wasted effort there is there. Um, so if you do have a bit of a whim and you're not sure if it would find favour with management, you're given the discretionary time to kind of play around with that in the hope that at least some of them will pay off. Um, so again, that's something we can take up offline if it's helpful because it is a big area. We've got five minutes left, so I, I think I'll take a, take a collection of questions and... Um get you to answer them collectively <laughs> if that's okay. So if we, if we start over here and then, and then here and then to the back and then we'll come over this side. Do you think there's a case for a campaign to get the Church of England to apologize for colluding with capitalism? So shall I take all three uh, and then come back? And also, also, I understand that Triodos are gonna be opening an, a current account in two years time. Oh, good, good plug. Um, Eve, I'm, I'm very much in sympathy with the overall thrust of what you say. You won't be surprised by that. But I, I just wonder whether to describe some of these aspects of capitalism as sins goes too far. For instance, the first one, um, competition. I mean, I think at its best, competition is a spur to excellence. And without it, you know, the quality of products or services would drop. Now, I grant that in the capitalist system that there is an awful lot of cooperation going on as well as competition, and often the cooperative elements go unrecognized. But uh, you yourself said cooperate where you can compete if you must. So it seems to suggest there is a valid place for competition. I wonder whether one, there needs to be a little more um, acknowledgement of positive aspects in, in some of the things you, you've slighted as sins. Okay, so apologies for competition and... saying it is to do with society more importantly to do with society 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 sorry a lot of what you were saying involves <coughs> society and what that is people yeah. working together good relationships i think that i don't understand why um there's so much opposition to uh, the concept of the state and that's never often not referred to or brought into discussions, that the state is the mechanism by which we get the army, the police force, local government, all sorts of things. And it seems to me that uh, as long as that's regarded as the enemy, uh, it'd be very difficult to actually uh, develop to a significant extent any sort of ideas of overall society. Mm. If the state and the rest of the organisations were seen to be working and saw each other as working together in some way that isn't there at the moment, it's the opposite we're at at the moment, I think that would make a big difference. I think you're right. If I take that one first, I mean, I think, I think post war we'd got used to government running everything for us because we were in a martial situation and we got through it, so everyone trusted the powers that be. And on the back of that, the post-war consensus around the welfare state and everything, it, it kind of made a lot of sense. So now we have quite a large state, which has replaced a lot of the things that, for instance, the church used to do, um, and is now kind of picking back up on where there are gaps left by the state, as we know. I think the problem is that it's all to do with trust, and I think that trust has eroded over time, um, particularly because of Thatcherite reforms and everything that happened there about you know, we're all individuals and everything. I think people have 
started to get more suspicious of what's been done in their name. And the politicians with all these scandals about expenses and everything haven't done themselves any favors. And the media, of course, you know, fuels all of that stuff. And there's now so much more media 24-7. We hear about all that stuff more, and it feels you know, more vital and like it's happening more and more with our money and you know, all the people that represent us. So I think there is a suspicion of the state at the moment, which is probably a life cycle thing. Um, and you know, it is a big job for the state to kind of correct um, and will probably take time. Um, so I think you're right about it's easy for us to have labels like you know, state or society or local or community or individual. Um, you know, it depends where you look at it. You know, we're all individuals, but we're also all states, we're all society, all of that kind of thing. And I, I don't think it's very helpful because I think it's normally used to make some political point. My point is that you have to start with yourself on one level because we've all been created with a purpose and a vocation and we're all ultimately accountable to God for what choices we make. That shouldn't stop us scaling up and trying through all our relationships to create more kingdom behavior around us. And that means taking an active role as an employee, as a volunteer, as a citizen, all of those roles that we have. Because um, otherwise we're just going to talk at some remove about what they should do and then they may or may not do it. But what we can do is something we can control and we can get cracking with. In terms of the, the church apologizing, it's a very difficult one because I think the church has colluded with all kinds of stuff over the generations and the centuries um, and it takes time for these things like slavery and women's rights and everything else to sort of emerge as being things that were unquestionably accepted in the past and are now obviously desperately awful. Um, I think in terms of colluding with capitalism, we all collude with it because it's, it's all around us. Um, I think where the church probably does need to have a, a look is about some of the calls it's made on our behalf around priorities. And James and his team spend a lot of their time helping the church with that to try and figure out you know, if the church needs X amount of money to operate and parishioners won't pay <laughs> that amount of money, how do you get it if you've got closed funds? And how do you get it ethically? Um, because you, know, you have to make calls about where you can get the most return. Um, and I think it's true that um, with all this disclosure coming out, um, it is helpful that you can now hold the church more to account because it's clearer where they are invested and what they're doing with that. When I first worked for the church commissioners, it was very much of a black eye. You had no idea what the holdings were and what was happening, whereas nowadays they're advertising what their voting has been over the year and where their holdings are. So you can actually ask harder questions, which I think Synod is trying to do. Around competition, Richard, I think um, I, I do have a bit of a bee in my bonnet about this because um, I, think, I think Stephen Green talks about this very beautifully. He says it's a, a, a confusion between the metaphor of war and uh, the metaphor of a game. So if we are um, celebrating the anniversary of World War I, that was all about win-lose and it was all about wiping out the enemy. And that was the, the construct. If you're talking about rugger or cricket, um, then you don't want to wipe out the competition because you won't be able to play them again if you do that. Um, and you need to kind of make sure the rules are healthy so that you can keep having really good competitions. And ideally, you want to beat them, but you also want them to give you quite a hard time because that keeps your professional level up and makes the game fun and more people will want to watch it and invest in it and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think that's quite a useful way to look at it. I think that because of all this testosterone stuff I talked about in terms of fight or flight responses, it has become, it feels a bit like, you know, a, a fight to the death. And those of you who've worked in the kind of financial services environment know that when you're in those dark rooms at four in the morning trying to win work, it feels like that. It feels like, you know, every last ounce of your energy needs to go into trying to outwit them and prevail and all that kind of stuff. And it's just bad thinking, um, fueled by some physiology that we could do more about. Um, but I agree that we all, we all compete. That's human nature. Um, but it's about trying not to make that the default. So the sin is making that default, not the competition per se. Thank you very much for your questions. It's, it's 7 o'clock, uh, and I can see the wine at the back. And I also saw a lot of more hands. Uh, so one of the things I'm tempted to say is do carry on the conversation over wine. I must come back to this point over here about the Church of England and say that although I want a membership body where the Church of England is the largest uh, organization and I work for a fund manager where the Church of England is the largest shareholder, I definitely can't talk for the Church of England. So it makes me incredibly independent when I say that I think the Church of England does an incredible amount of really good work in regards to being an investor and engaging. And over the next couple of weeks, the Church Investors Group will release a report on how we go about engaging with companies to tell you exactly the steps we take. So I, I do uh, point to you that way. 
I want to take one last opportunity for everyone to thank Eva, and um, thank you for coming this evening. Thank you.